Good afternoon, my conscious co-creators. Welcome to another edition of the Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity. I am very, very pleased you are here today for another special show with an intriguing guest. I think you're, you're going to like. This is going to be an interesting conversation today. Um, but first, of course, we have our quotes of the day from the universe and from Abraham to kick us off. Let's get started. We've got kind of actually long quotes today, um, which is unusual. They're usually pretty short. But let's see what the universe and Abraham have in store for us today. First, from the universe. The perfection of your every issue is beyond human comprehension. Don't be fooled. You've made no mistakes. The territory behind you and the challenges at hand were precisely crafted to deliver the wisdom and insights that'll make possible the most joyful time of your life so far. You didn't come here to face hurdle after hurdle after hurdle. It's not as if by mastering your issues today, more issues will be added tomorrow. That only happens when you deny them today. Master your issues today and be free. Get through what you must get through today. Understand what troubles you t today. Do what you can today and all the rest will be made easy. So little can yield so much. A new perspective, an admission, a surrender to truth, however painful, changes everything. You are so deserving of everything you want. The universe. Ah, we love our quotes from Mike Dooley in the universe. Today, I think, um, uh, trying to remind us about today. Uh, getting us to understand that life is not here to test us. Life is not here to constantly give us trial after trial after trial that really life is here to serve us and that the challenges that we face today, when we face them today and we truly deal with them and we work them out in that deep internal level, then uh, they are worked out not just for today, but for the future. Now, this is not to say that there aren't going to be other challenges in the future. But it's not that these, it's, it's the universe trying to just heap on challenge after situation after issue, one on top of the other. It's all just part of our evolution and our growth. And so when we deal with things in the present moment, today, when things are presented to us, then we deal with them and then we never have to deal with them again. Eh, we might get a reminder once in a while, but they're, they're more than taken care of. Um, I, I always used to say to my clients, I don't say it anymore, but it's like if the universe is trying to get your attention and they kind of like tap you on the shoulder and if you don't pay attention and then they like gives you a little nudge and still don't pay attention, then eventually it hits you upside the head with a two by four. But um, let's all work on like just paying attention when we get that little nudge. We don't want the two by four. All right. <laughs> All right. Now let's see what Abraham has in store for us today. You can tell by the way you feel in the midst of what you are doing, whether you are perceiving from the wholeness of who you are or whether you've got yourself crossways of the current and are disallowing your broader point of view. If you are disallowing your happiness, you are disallowing everything you believe will make you happy. If you are disallowing clarity, you are disallowing everything that you believe will make you feel secure and sure-footed. Abraham. Different kind of quote for Abraham. Um, but I believe what Abraham is really trying to convey here is that it's how we feel in the middle of whatever it is we're engaged in. And it's, and it's that... Are we allowing ourselves to enjoy the moment? Are we allowing ourselves to be happy? Or at least are we allowing ourselves to experience some relief? Um, whatever leans us in the direction of moving forward, whatever leans us in the direction of 
greater happiness, greater clarity, uh, greater uh, uh, joy. Uh, you know, so much would we say that really the, the, the journey is not about getting to the destination. It's about joyfully walking upon the path. Now, the thing is, if you're perceiving that this little, you know, pebble in your shoe, like has to get out of there, or there's no way you can enjoy walking on the path, you're, you're disallowing whatever potential joy you could have in the moment. Because maybe that pebble is in your shoe, so you can sit down, take a break, and maybe you don't need to be walking on the path right now. Or maybe you should just take a moment to, you know, get whatever is, is nudging you or bothering you out of your system, out of your shoe. Sit, maybe look around, look at the view, and really enjoy the moment before continuing on your path. Because so often, and hey, look, I'm, I admit it, I'm the pot calling the kettle black. So often we're just rushing to get somewhere. We're, we're just looking to, to, to get to the destination and we're not really appreciating everything that we have around us. You know, I love to go hiking. Haven't done any hiking since the shutdown, but I'd love to go hiking. But I don't like to go hiking with those people who are super fit and they're practically running through the hike and they barely take any breaks and they don't stop to enjoy the view. And I understand they're doing it for exercise and they're just, you know, way ahead of me when it comes on that scale of, of being in shape. But I love hiking that, you know, uh, and yeah, I like getting a bit of a workout, but I love like stopping along the way, looking at the views, appreciating, appreciating nature, you know, looking for whatever wildlife or maybe flowers or mushrooms or, you know, whatever unusual things might be along the path. To me, that makes the hike just so much more interesting and, and just so much more joyful in a way because it, it takes me out of what I'm used to. And I'm not so pointed to like, ah, I, I just, I'm there to get to the end of the trail. I'm there just to get to the top of the mountain. There are plenty of beautiful views all the way up and all the way down the mountain. So... Um, you can always tell moment by moment, you know, what you're allowing by how you're feeling about what's going on. Two quotes very much in alignment. I swear these are like the quotes came in this morning. And uh, I think they're kind of related to, to what we're going to be talking about today. And so uh, it is my pleasure uh, to bring on to the show my guest, uh, Dean Foster. Not good to be confused with the science fiction author, Alan Dean Foster. Do you know him, Dean? Yes, very well. <laughs> and Alan knows me. And we both, we, we both have agreed to like make that very clear to everyone we speak with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what, like when I first got the, uh, the message about having you on the show, I was like, that's not Alan Dean Foster, is it? No, 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 it can't be, it can't be. I love, I love this stuff. Anyway, Dean is the founder of DFA Intercultural Global Solutions and former worldwide director of Berlitz Cross-Cultural. That's the language organization, right? Yes, indeed. And, and currently executive strategic consultant for Del, Dwell Works Intercultural. Dean has worked with, the, with most major Fortune 500 companies, national governments, and NGOs, uh, and as a guest lecturer and faculty for premier educational institutions, including Harvard Business School, Columbia University School of Business, NYU, and Darden Business School. His work has taken him to more than 100 countries. He is host on CNN of the Nationwide Doing Business In series, a frequent guest commentator on cultural, global work, and social issues for CNN, CNBC, and BBC, and other radio and TV shows, and has been interviewed in Newsweek, USA Today, The New York Times, and many other places. Um, in 2012, Dean was inducted into the worldwide ERC's prestigious Hall of Leaders, and in 2013, he received the Forum for Expatriate Management's acclaimed Lifetime Achievement Awards. Dean has written many articles and published five books, wow, including Bargaining Across Borders, voted as one of the top 10 business books of the year by the American Library Association. As a contributing editor with National Geographic, he wrote the monthly Cultural Wise, 
column appearing in National Geographic Traveler magazine. Welcome to the Conscious Consultant Hour, Dean. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate your efforts there going through all that very long bio. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I like to let my audience know that, uh, you know, we don't have any uh, slackers on this show. <laughs> all right, we try, we try. <laughs> we try, we try. So I'm just curious, you know, I don't often meet, I mean, every now and then I do meet some people who, who are very attuned and even work in this, this whole idea of cultural sensitivity across cultural communications. But, but how did you get interested in this initially? I mean, was this something, you know, w w did your parents take you when you were a little kid traveling around the world? Or was this uh, sort of an interest that developed later in life? No, I think, in fact, um, it, it goes really right to my DNA. And maybe, as you mentioned uh, with my parents, um, they didn't take me to any foreign locations. We didn't have that opportunity growing up. Oh, and really? maybe it's because we didn't have that opportunity that I sought it out. So so uh -huh. aggressively. And uh, when I had the opportunity to do so, I did. Um, so I grew up in New York City, in, in Brooklyn, one of the most multicultural places in the world. Absolutely. And, and, and all around me were people from everywhere else. And, and, and I think very early, I was kind of fascinated by that, uh, frightened by it, um, mm -hmm. kind of in awe of it, uh, had a lot of strong feelings about it. And um, it set me on a path I didn't know it at the time, but it set me at, at, at a path that would culminate in this kind of lifetime career. Um, I, I took, um, I majored in uh, anthropology and sociology when I was in grad school. And, you know, my dad was a, a very wise but practical man. And he said, what are you going to do with a degree in anthropology and sociology? And, and I think I frightened him, actually, by saying I, I didn't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I knew that I didn't want to spend my time, um, you know, on archaeological digs. And I was fascinated with the whole idea of culture and its effect on how we are who we are, um, how it determines the cultural being that we are and that we become, hmm. and how it determines the behaviors of individuals and organizations and nation states as well. Um, and so I tried um, almost unconsciously seeking a path where I could develop um, a lifetime career around this. And, and I think to your point that the universe is always telling us how to do things if we listen to it. Um, I listened to it and I saw the opportunities. It was the beginning of the 90s. U.S. companies were looking to globalize their business operations. They right. needed to understand the impact that culture has on business. And myself and a few colleagues uh, founded a small consulting company around presenting the whole idea of considering culture before you step into the business end of doing things with people abroad. And, and what had you been doing right before that? Well, I, I was in grad school and I was oh. also very much involved in music. And oh. um, I was... Uh, doing a lot of songwriting, a lot of uh, publishing, a lot of performing. Um, so I had a very, very multi-track uh, career. But uh -huh. I went, you know, fin finished my graduate degrees and, and then got involved in, in consulting, which really took me to where I needed to be. I see, I see. So pretty much from, from most of your professional life, this is what you've been doing. For over 30 years, we have been wow. consulting with organizations um, on understanding the impact that culture has when you work and live with people who are different in culture from you. Okay, wonderful. So we're going to take a quick break. And so when we come back, uh, uh, I'm going to ask you a few questions about, you know, why, and let's talk a little bit about why this is so important, especially in today's world. And then we'll, we'll get into how to actually um, really negotiate sort of these different cultural challenges that we have, especially today when we're so interconnected. OK, absolutely. Great. All right. Wonderful. So everybody, please stay tuned. You're listening to the Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity. We do this every Thursday, 12 noon to 1 p.m. right here on talkradio.nyc and all over Facebook with our live stream video. And we will be right back after this. Yeah. 
And welcome back to the Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity. We're talking this hour with Dean Foster, uh, was a, a founder of DFA Intercultural Global Solutions, and we're talking all about this whole concept of sort of cross-cultural uh, awareness and and why it's important to really perceive. Uh, things differently when you're dealing with people from around the world. And today, I mean, right, Dean, more than ever before, we're, we're an intercultural society, aren't we? Yeah, every minute, every day, every year that goes by, it's more and more and more. Absolutely. Right. And uh, taking, taking the, the politics out of the equation, uh, mm -hmm. globalization is continuing, technology is driving it, and we are more and more interconnected than ever. And it happens increasingly every moment. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's something I, I say to people all the time. It's like, uh, not only are we uh, 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 like economically uh, uh, interdependent on each other, but, but in so many ways with communication so tight and now being able to talk to, I mean, I have conversations on a weekly basis with people in Europe, in India, even some people in Australia, Africa. And it just amazes me because I remember when I was growing up, it was like just to make a phone call to another country cost you like five bucks for a minute. You know, it was crazy. Exactly. exactly. And that's one of the reasons why I think this is such an optimistic moment. I yeah. mean, we're, we, it's hard to see, I think, in the, in the moment that we're existing with, with the issues that are facing us, um, that we have opportunities that never existed to humanity before. Right. And if we view the situation that way, we can move forward. But if we get stuck in all of the challenges of the moment, then we can't see the bigger picture. It, it, exactly. It really just depends which aspect of what's going on we're choosing to focus on. Are we focusing on what opportunities exist or are we just focusing on the challenges that are in front of us? Precisely. So I, I, um, I have a friend, his name's Martin, who, who worked in human resources, and he actually did a little bit of this kind of cross-cultural sensitivity uh, work. And, and I remember talking with him one time about, you know, and this was years ago. This was probably 10, 15 years ago. And I asked him, I said, you know, why is this so important? And he gave me an example, and I always use this example, and I think you'd really appreciate this. As he said, he had a meeting one time with a, a, a corporate meeting, and there were people in the meeting from the United States, from India, and from China. And they all had to cooperate on this project. And so he had to get them to see that they each saw things very differently. So what he asked them to do was to, to you know, on the whiteboard to draw a representation of time. And right. so the American gets up first, points a little dot, draws a straight line, another little dot at the end, and that was his representation of time. And then the, the Chinese person got up and takes the marker and draws a circle. And then the, the person from India gets up, grabs the marker, and draws a spiral going outward. Now, this is all representing the same concept, time, but it is such a different way of looking at it. And when he told me the story, to me, it was a big, like, I'm, I'm you know, my wife is from China. I, I've been around people from other cultures. I'm like you, a native New Yorker. I'm, I'm always used to being around people from different cultures. But, but just when he told me this story, it really impacted me. Like, oh, my God, like we really do need to understand how different people see things because such a basic concept as time can be viewed so differently. Exactly. I, there are two, I think, really important um, things that I'm struck with by that example and in that story. Number one, and the reason we talk about culture, the reason we have to understand that it's an issue that's on the table, whether we're doing business with people from other cultures or whether we're um, making decisions, political decisions about countries, or whether we're just trying to live in a neighborly way with someone who's different from ourselves down the street. The reason it's on the table and the reason we have to talk about it is precisely because it's invisible. Mm -hmm. We don't really think about it on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's, it's deep inside us. And when you are in your own culture, it's like a fish in the water. It doesn't see the water. 
you can't see the water. So right. you have to make it visible and you have to talk about the fact that in India, we're going to see time differently. And this is the way we see it, as opposed to the way we see it here. Your uh, epiphany in that story with your friend probably came from the fact that you never thought before that there could be these differences in this very deep, invisible level. So right. that's one really important aspect of culture. Uh, the other thing that I think I find really wonderful about that story is that it's so optimistic. It, <laughs> you know, people get stuck. People get stuck with um, the problem of managing cultural differences. Yeah. They get stuck by saying, oh, there are these differences. I don't understand them. And once I understand them, I have to put such effort into figuring out a way to strategically manage them. And do we really need to do this anyway? Aren't we all the same? And I've heard these things a hundred million times. No, we're not the same. We're very different when it comes to culture. Yeah. And the bad news, I guess, is that there is this issue that you have to manage. But the good news, and this is the optimistic part, is that you now have a tool for thinking about things differently right. that you may never have had before. And that can lead you to new solutions to old problems. The fact that we automatically default to a, to a negative place, to a problem place, mm -hmm. when we think about culture at right. first, I kind of find that interesting because yeah. you could default to a very positive place. I mean, why should it really be surprising at the end of the day that people think differently, you know, 20,000 right. miles away? But it shouldn't like, be surprising. That, doesn't that also like make things so interesting? I mean, to me, it's, right. like, when I meet people from other cultures who are just so different, to me, that's fascinating. That's interesting. That makes life juicy, you know? Precisely. And it's a gift. Yeah. It's a gift. It's an opportunity to, to think about things differently because your culture gave you your viewpoint. Right. And it's a limited viewpoint. Right. It solves a lot of problems. It probably solved a lot of problems for the folks who created the culture years and centuries ago. But it may not be solving the problems of today. Right. And so, those solutions will come from different ways of seeing things. Right. So, so let's say I'm a, a, I'm a manager or, or even let's say I'm an entrepreneur. But I'm someone in business. And, I'm, and, and in some fashion, whether they're employees or coworkers or customers or vendors that I'm having to deal with that are from other cultures, what can I do to kind of be more aware of it when I'm dealing with them? Because I don't necessarily have time to study on every single different culture in the world. What kinds of things can I do to be more mindful of it? Right. I, I, I'll make three comments. Number one. Turn on your humility <laughs> and turn off your ego. Yeah. All right. Understand that there's a really high likelihood that this person is thinking differently about the issue that's on the table than you are. And you're not going to change them because you didn't even know where to start. So it, it, in the absence of knowing this information and to the degree that you can get this information, yes, Go ahead and do it. To your point, it's fascinating, it's interesting, and, and it will be very enlightening. But there are limits to what people can do. So remain humble. Understand that there will be differences. You may not know what they are. And then in order to find out, enlist them as an ally in your journey mm -hmm. to understand where they're coming from. Uh, ask questions so many times. People just don't want to ask the question. But if you're humble about it, you can say, look, I've never been to India before. You are one of the first Indian people that I've ever worked with before. Um, I really want to understand your culture. Tell, tell me something that, that you think is important for me to know about working in your country. I mean, being open and honest in a respectful, humble way can take you very far. Right. right. And, and are there certain... Uh, uh, themes that are common across different cultures? Like, are there certain commonalities that we can uh, focus on that can help us to sort of create that connection when we're dealing with someone yeah. from a different culture? I, absolutely. I think at the, the end of the day, we are probably all much more similar than we are different. But it's those differences that can get in the way. 
Right. And what you want to do is is not let them get in the way. You want to use them as collaborative tools for solving whatever problem is facing both of you. So what you want to do is understand where those differences are and then use your commonalities to address them. In other words, at the end of the day, we all want to achieve our goals. We all want safety. We all want health. We all want success. But we may define those things in different ways, and we certainly have different ways of achieving those those things. Mm. So if I understand your way of achieving those things, I can help you do that. And you can help me achieve it on my side as well. Right, right. So it's really kind of about um, just understanding, n- not necessarily completely understanding, but understanding the different perspective and how that different perspective can have very uh, positive traits to it. And, and just by, by virtue of having that different perspective, like that can be a real asset in whatever project, challenge, situation you're dealing with at the time. Yeah, I really do. And in a very practical way, um, I, I, I think it's important to realize that one of the styles of business that U.S. Americans have, um, and this is, a, this is a manifestation of our culture, um, it was very productive at a certain point in our history and probably still is in many ways. Uh, but one of those aspects of American culture is to get straight to the point, to do, mm. to do the deal, to make sure that we solve the problem, and then we can move on. And if we're successful, it becomes proof uh, and validation of a relationship. But for most of the rest of the world, it's the other way around. Mm. For most of the rest of the world, you don't get to solving the problem. You don't get to the deal. You don't get to the solution until you have a relationship first. Mm. Yeah. So one of the things that U.S. Americans have to do is step back, take the time to understand that people need to develop trust. They need to feel good about you. They need to want to do business with you, independent of the, the great offer that you present to them. Mm. And once you develop that kind of relationship, then all the rest follows. So if you do develop that relationship, you can get to understand their culture and figure out ways to solve the problems that they have. And they, in turn, will help you solve the problems you have. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Wonderful. Um, We're going to take another break. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit about dealing with the challenges, you know, dealing with sort of the difficulties when you're dealing cross-cultural and how to do that. And, um, and sort of maybe if you have some tips or some tools for our audience uh, for, for how they can do it. And I want you to keep in mind, our audience is not just American. We're, we're international. They're over, we're heard in over a hundred countries around the world. So you never know who might be hearing this uh, broadcast. So Uh, Let's keep that in mind as well. Okay, so everybody, please stay tuned. You're listening to the Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity. We do this every Thursday, 12 noon to 1 p.m. Eastern Time here in New York City, right here on talkradio.nyc and on Facebook, and we will be right back after this. And welcome back to the Conscious Consultant Hour Awakening Humanity. We're speaking with Dean Foster all about sort of cross-cultural awareness and sensitivity. And, you know, Dean, the first time, well, the first time in business, well, first time in my own business, not necessarily in business, but first time in my own business when uh, I I came across this real challenge in in sort of doing business cross-cultural um, I would. I had a, um, a video publishing company back in the VHS days where we were licensing Japanese animation and putting it out in the U.S. market. And although I didn't really deal with the negotiations for the licensing so much, my partner John did. And I just remember him coming like back from like the phone calls and meetings and being so frustrated 
because it was like he couldn't, it took forever to get anywhere and they were so difficult to deal with at the time. And I also remembered like uh, uh, when you met somebody from Japan business wise, like you really, when, when they give you their business card, it's like a real ritual and you have to like take it and look at it and, 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 and like, you know, really pay attention to it. Otherwise they get insulted. So, so it really kind of struck me at that time that, you know, there are some real challenges with dealing with people in different cultures. Uh, how do you, how do you manage that? How do you, mm. how do you, how do you deal with that and still be able to move through? through the challenge to get to where you want to go. Well, when you talk about culture, there, think of it as two levels. There's, think of it as like an iceberg. There's the visible part. That's the part where we're exchanging business cards and we don't know what to do and, and we feel kind of uncomfortable about it because we don't know what to do. And then there's that invisible part, which is the bottom of the iceberg, and it's much bigger, and it, but you don't see it. And, and that's all the things that are going on in people's minds that are making them think in different ways from the way you think. And I think that if you're a responsible global citizen, or at least not even a citizen, just participating in the global reality of, of this moment, and you can't deny that, that it's global, um, right. then you do have to take responsibility for understanding the de- to the degree that you can what these differences are. And and I'm sure that your colleague found it very frustrating to work with the Japanese, not because the Japanese are intentionally frustrating and not because what they do is live a very frustrating life, because if that were the case, they'd be frustrated with themselves as well. And and they're probably not. Uh, They're probably going about things amongst themselves in a way that makes a lot of sense. But it's frustrating to the outsider, the guy Jim in this case, mm-hmm. because you don't understand it. And therefore, the solution is figure it out, learn about it. One of the things that was probably very frustrating for your colleague was the fact that the Japanese make decisions in consensus. Yeah. So they're not in what we refer to as an individualist culture like the U.S. and like many other countries around the world. So that before any kind of decision can be made, even a baby step, the entire team that's involved in that decision has to be consulted and they have to come up with a hundred percent consensus, which means everybody in the team, if there are 10 people on the team, everybody's got to have their questions answered. Everyone has to look at every detail. They are also very risk avoidant. So they don't want to take responsibility for overlooking anything. And because it, in the fear that it makes the outcome not as good as it could be. Mm-hmm. So this combination of high risk avoidance and consensus driven decision making makes it very frustrating for the U.S. American who's looking for fast decisions based on yeah. just enough information. Yeah. And, and expecting individuals to come up with ideas and, and, and solutions without having to consult with the team first. Mm hmm. And, and I've heard from some colleagues who uh, were trying to hire like some Japanese employees that it was very difficult to get a good feel on, on them, on that individual, because any kind of reference they got from their Japanese companies always talked about the team that they were on and not them as an individual, that they were so uh, uh, group oriented that they don't even necessarily recognize people for their individual efforts. In fact, it's embarrassing to expect the individual Japanese to speak about themselves. Yeah. Um, it, there's an inherent humility and a deference to others and to the group. You right. know, we're living in a moment right now with COVID, which is probably the most um, startling example of this mm-hmm. because for For decades in Japan and throughout most of Asia, if you had a cold, you would put on a mask and you would wear the mask not not because you didn't want others to give you a cold, Mm -hmm. but rather because it was your responsibility as an individual member of a larger group not to spread the cold that you had to others. Yeah, yeah. When Sony, when Sony Walkman first developed 
the, the Walkman going back, what, 20, 30 years now. Yeah. They marketed it as a device where you could listen to music privately without disturbing others. Mm. And this whole idea, when it gets translated to the West, has to be flipped over. So we're now in this debate in, 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 the, in the world of COVID here as to this whole issue of mask wearing. Right. which is such a challenge for individual Amer individual oriented Americans yeah. who don't see this the responsibility that they have right to protect others from their germs uh, and as one of my friends says it, it, wearing a mask is an act of kindness you know it's not a political statement it's not an infringement on your rights it's an act of kindness to other people and, and that's one of the things that I think gets us in so much trouble sometimes here in the United States is we're so individualistic. We're so far in the other extreme from the Japanese that then we don't really take into account our effect on other people. We're just looking at the effect on us. Well, from a very big picture, you know, the societies and the cultures that developed in the West and the U.S. is, is in this case an extreme example of this highlights the importance and underscores the importance always legally in fact of individual rights versus mm. the collective good right. and that in fact the belief is if you give the individuals the opportunity to advance their individual rights the collective good will benefit as a side benefit right. but in asia it's just the other way around right you have to create societies first that address the issues of the collective good. And then if individuals challenge that, then that becomes the issue of the day. So in Asia, the, the, the dilemma is always how to protect the individual and individual rights against the collective or the state. Right. And in the West, I think the challenge in many ways is how do we, how do we create collective good without diminishing individual rights? Right, right. Right. And it's just in, in this particular case, when you're dealing with a worldwide pandemic, in, in some ways, the, the Asian and the Eastern countries are doing much better at it than we are because of that mindset of the collective good. Because a pandemic is not something that's about an individual, it's something about the whole. Precisely. But remember, there's good and bad to all of these. And when you work on these extremes, Right. You're going to see a lot of good and a lot of bad. Right. And, and I think the human challenge, and this is where we have this great optimistic opportunity right now, is to learn about, well, what are the benefits of this collective mindset? Mm. And for the Asians to understand, what are the benefits of the individualist mindset? Because mm. it's neither is all good or all bad. Right. And they, cre they, they evolved out of the necessities of these societies mm -hmm. over centuries and right. provided both societies with great opportunities. But when you go into the extreme, you then start to see some problems. Mm -hmm. And that's where we can learn from each other. And this is the value of understanding the cultural moment. Absolutely. I'm totally with you. It's, it's going to the extremes is what always gets us in trouble. And when we learn to balance things out a little bit and, and, and a little more in harmony, of course, sometimes you go to extremes, but it's more about finding the blend of both that actually serves us the best. Exactly. Patty, our loyal listener on Facebook, says, just be kind and open. I worked with ladies from India, Philippines, Vietnam, Germany, Korea, so many cultures. Our potlucks were fantastic. <laughs> I, I bet. Relationships. That's it. Yes. Build relationships based on, on the similarities and then understand. You'll be able to then understand. You have a path to working with the differences. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay. Time to take our last break. Um, when we come back, what I would like to talk about is just uh, uh, just a little bit more in sort of the practical end of dealing with people with different cultures, you know, ver whether in person or virtually. And then, like, let's just uh, look at our crystal ball a little bit and see where you think things are going kind of interculturally, okay? Oh, great. All right, wonderful. So everybody, please stay tuned. You're listening to the Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity. We'll be right back after this.
And welcome back to the Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity. We've been speaking this hour with Dean Foster, not to be confused with Alan Dean Foster, uh, uh, all about cross-cultural awareness, uh, mindfulness, and and sensitivity. So, um, Dean, I wanted to ask you, um, when you're confronted with someone from another culture that's very different from your own, and it could be how they dress, how they act, um, how they observe their, their uh, religions, um, th- how they eat. Um, and it's just so different from what you're used to. How do you, how do you relate to them? Or like, how do you deal with them in a, in a business setting that um, shows that you're trying to be understanding, but that you really don't get it? Well, I, I think you be as open as you possibly can to admitting that you don't get it and to ask and to ask the kind of questions in a humble way in a respectful way that give you the answers to the things you need to know. Um, And and I think we don't do that enough. Mm. And remember that our similarities probably far outweigh our differences, Differences. but it's the little differences sometimes that can make for big problems. Um, So the similar, I think it's important to remember that similarities don't negate the differences. You uh, can't ignore the differences. They're right, there. Right. And, and there are many cultures where the differences are quite extreme. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are many cultures where the differences are very, very few. Mm-hmm. You know, so the differences, for example, between, let's say, a U.S. American and, a, um, and someone in China may be, 80% different, 20% similar. I, I don't know. I'm just using right. that as an example. Right, right, right. Just arbitrary. But the differences between a U.S. American and a Canadian yeah. might be 95% similar and only 5% different. Yeah. It doesn't matter. The similarities are what you use to build on, but the differences are still going to be the things that make the problems. Right, right. Have you noticed that there are any particular course cultural challenges in this new uh, world of zoom and virtual meetings and, and, and dealing with everyone virtually instead of in person it, as the, the, the cultural challenges, are they any different online than they are in person or are they pretty much the same? Well, they're pretty much the same. I think uh, they take a different form. Um, but one of the things we have to be sensitive to is the fact that they don't go away simply because we're now zooming. Right. Um, right. The whole idea of technology is that it kind of equalizes everything and and I think gives us the impression, for example, that um, we're all the same. I can see you. Um, I can see that you're another human being, no matter where, what country you happen to be in. Um, and I think we have it's easy to forget that these cultural differences are still there and still right. operating only right. in a Zoom environment. Um, right. which means that uh, our, the language that we use to communicate by necessity is probably some form of global English, uh, which mm-hmm. may not be exactly the English that you speak in right. your country or the English that is spoken as a learned language, perhaps in another country. Uh, but there's this impression that we're all speaking English. So that has to be unmasked. And we have to learn some techniques for managing, let's say, the global English that is being spoken on a Zoom conversation. Mm. Um, So that's a little bit different. um, But but I think the bottom line is that, yeah, the cultural issues are still most definitely there. Right, right. What do you feel in in today's environment is, um, um, uh, uh, in the business world, sort of the biggest challenge when it comes to this this cross-cultural uh, 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 connection that we now all have the biggest the biggest challenge is denying it and, oh, okay. and um, the the idea that because of technology mm-hmm. and because the world has been getting smaller because of technology mm-hmm. that therefore these cultural differences don't exist or we we're, we're overcoming them or that new generations understand these things implicitly, although Lord knows how anybody can understand it implicitly. But this idea that that's what's happening, uh, this is all this all needs to be countered. Um, do cultures change? Yeah, sure they do. Um, it's very dynamic. 
um, do individuals learn about other cultures? I would say that the current generation is probably more mindful of the fact that differences exist, right. but I don't think they're any more informed as to how to manage those differences. Right. Unless they've had the experience of actually working and living in another country. And there are probably more people today with that experience than ever before, but it's a fairly small group of people. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that are, that's an interesting dichotomy that I see is that while we're becoming more and more interconnected globally, and while we're becoming more and more an intercultural global society, there's a lot of people who don't like that. There's a lot of people who kind of fear losing their cultural identity. If we look in our crystal ball into the future, do you see that happening? I mean, what kinds of shifts, if we're more looking on the big level, do, do you think are, we're, we're headed towards? You know, I've spent 30 plus years in this field, and I'm still a New Yorker from, <laughs> from New York City. I haven't lost Give me a good that. bagel. Give me a good bagel. <laughs> I haven't lost that. And Lord knows, I hope I never do. I'm yeah. proud of that. Yeah. Um, that's my identity. Right. But what I think I've done is I've added to it. So whatever knowledge I've, I've gained in, through working with other cultures, whatever new perspective these folks have given me, and it, it, and it has been a gift to be given these perspectives, mm -hmm. it hasn't changed who I am. I'm in full control over what I do with this information. And it enables me to work more effectively with these folks when I have to, and much more authentically. I can be myself, but with the knowledge that who I am has an effect on people in certain ways. So I don't think the fear comes really from losing their identity. I think the fear comes from not knowing who these other people are and not feeling comfortable about how to manage that. Right. Right. So are there things that people can do in general that can just help them to feel more at ease when they come across somebody from a new culture? Sam, can I be self-serving and say it's anybody living in the global world today? It's yeah. your responsibility to learn as much as you can about these things. Absolutely. And, you know, I'm not the only one, but um, I've written five books on this. You know, we've got a website where you can get this information. You can just, before you jump on the plane, next time you can get back on the plane, you can look this stuff up. And, and, and so the information's out there. And, yeah. you know, our work, my work is as a cultural concierge yeah. to help people get this information. Right. And um, that's what we're here for. And, and what is your website? So if people want to learn more about you and, and, you know, look up some information, where can they find you? Sure. It's deanfosterglobal.com. That's easy. All, all, all our books, all my books are there, all of the different programs that we have. Lots of information about different cultures is available for free right on the website. And I have a podcast as well called oh. Oops, Your Culture Showing. Ah, cool. where we talk, where we have a lot of fun with cultural differences because they can be very funny and challenging as well. And so we'll talk about cultural differences and how to manage them in the podcast. Oops, your culture is showing. Wonderful, wonderful. And where can people find that? Wherever you go for your favorite podcasts. Okay, cool. And how often does your show come out? Uh, we come out with a new episode every month. Every month. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. And, uh, okay, so let's take a quick look into our crystal balls. I'm going to pretend that you're actually a science fiction writer now. And, and like, <laughs> if we were to look at the world in another 20 years, 30 years, what do you think is going to be different when it comes to the cultural side of things? Well, I would hope that when it comes to the cultural side of things, there'll be a lot more people who aren't denying its importance as much as uh, they have in the past that there'll be a greater awareness of the fact that this is something that we have to manage, that there will be some probably increased development of what I call a global culture where we are working more similarly than we are different. Um, but right now that's at a very superficial level. Uh, perhaps 20 or 30 years from now, it'll be at a little bit more of a deeper level. Um, my greatest hope is that we, 
as we are forced to interact with each other, that instead of retreating in fear and instead of retreating into violence or any of the awful things that can happen when cultures interact, that we find a way to learn from each other. Mm. The bad news is that cultural interaction historically has never led to understanding brotherhood, peace, and kumbaya. Yeah. Whenever there's been initial cultural interaction, it's usually not been good. I yeah. don't understand you. You don't understand me. Therefore, I'm right. You're wrong. And constant yeah. exploitation, colonialization, etc., and all the political nasties that can come. But um, I would hope that we don't want to do that anymore and that the, the forced interaction that we're having with each other in this particular moment maybe gives us an inflection point for reflection. Mm. And maybe going forward, we can take the opportunity that we are now interacting with people that we don't understand, but let me first try to understand them before I beat them over the head. Yeah. And um, I guess it's it's kind of, you know, in, in today's world, to me, it's it's kind of curious how I think from the people, from like the grassroots level, people are coming together more, yet sort of on the leadership, there's some kind of disconnect because the leaders seem to be fighting with each other more. Right. And, I think the political systems that exist are the result of societies that created these systems because there was a benefit to doing so when they did. I think what's happening now is that, and here's the good news, that people at the grassroots level are much more interconnected and much more collaborative yeah. and much more willing to learn from each other. Right. But that it, these differences are being politicized because of old status quo systems yeah. Yeah. that are now at a point of crashing and yeah. and falling apart. Yep. yep. And so we're seeing a very stark difference between these two forces. Yeah, yeah. Well, Dean, we're out of time. Thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to come on my show today. I really appreciate it. Really love this topic. So I'm, I'm glad we had a chance to do this. Sam, it's been great. And... Um, Alan Dean Foster, yeah, he's a great science fiction writer, but I kind of think that maybe I'm dealing with science and not necessarily science fiction. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And listen, when you when things open up and, and uh, th we get relatively back to normal here in New York City, uh, let's get together and uh, have a bagel or something, okay? Build a relationship. Absolutely. Absolutely. And thank you, everybody, for tuning in. I also just posted on the, the Facebook Live, I have my webinar coming up next Tuesday at noon uh, about how to use a podcast to find your tribe. The link is links, L-I-N-K-S dot talkradio dot N-Y-C slash find your tribe. Please register for it. Share it with your friends. Uh, it's a free webinar, and uh, last time people really liked my webinar, so hopefully you'll enjoy this one. So thank you all for tuning in. Stay tuned. Coming up next, it's uh, Ken Foster and his show, Voices of Courage, and later this afternoon, Antonia with her show, So Now You Know, followed by uh, Graham Dobbin and his show, The Mind Behind. Take care, everybody. We will talk to you next week.